have rarely heard people talk about a TV show the way that they talk about Pachinko. The second season of the show just came out, and what I love is people are practically tearing up when they tell you about it. Today on the podcast, why Pachinko is one of the best shows on TV right now. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, look, one of the more one of the more critically acclaimed TV shows in recent years is Pachinko. It is based on the best-selling book by Min Jin Lee, and it tells the story of how the Japanese occupation of Korea resonates across three generations of a Korean family. We're talking about them navigating war and loss and love and migration. Let me just play you a tiny little bit of the trailer. Season two of Pachinko just kicked off on Apple TV+. Plus. I spoke with Michelle Cho and Rachel Ho about the show and the way that it handles all this emotional weight of its subject matter. For anyone who's not read the book or watched the show so far, here's Michelle talking about the premise of Pachinko. So this is a story, it's kind of part of this grand tradition of this historical epic, and it's Mm. focusing on an ethnic minority group in Japan, um, which is referred to as Zayanichi. So Koreans, ethnic Koreans in Japan, mostly, but members of this family move between Korea, Japan, and the U.S. And Mm. so it's also a trilingual story, which Mm. is really interesting. And it's part of what's so unprecedented and unique about this mm-hmm. this particular story. Um, so yeah, pachinko, for those people who are not familiar with the, the word, <laughs> is um, a kind of, pop, it's a popular game, kind of a popular form of gambling in Japan. Mm. Um, it's a game that's like a kind of cross between pinball and slot machines. Mm-hmm. And so the story is called Pachinko because it's this metaphor for the ways that the characters are kind of like flung about like the pinball, the little pachinko balls mm. by circumstances, by history, by, you know, kind of geopolitics. And yet we are never disconnected from the kind of feelings and experiences and deeply personal um, kind of emotional landscape of these characters. So, yeah, I don't know if that's too much, but <laughs> hopefully it piques people's interest. That's not too much at yes. all. Can you actually just, can you just root us a little bit more? Cause you mentioned sort of a grand sweeping history. Can you just root us a little bit in the historical relationship at this point between Japan and Korea in 1915? What is going on then? Yes, exactly. So, um, so the story spans 1915 to 1989, mm. which is like most of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. 20th century is really tumultuous. Um, in East Asia, Japan has an empire. It's kind of learned mm-hmm. from observing European empire that it needs to kind of get into that game and modernize Asia through its imperial exploits. And so Korea, the Korean peninsula is a Japanese colony. So mm. um, it does, it's, it's a, a period of time where, um, yeah, the, the Korean Japanese relationship is really fraught because there's clearly a sense of discrimination, a kind of racism, intra, inter-Asian racism mm-hmm. that you see a lot in the show. Um, and yet there's also this like strange thing happening where the position of Koreans shifts around. They're supposed to kind of think of themselves as loyal to Japanese empire as part of that imperial project, but then they're continuously uh, discriminated against and they have limited opportunities because of their ethnicity. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of what we see going on. Mm -hmm. I I love the idea of a sort of a grand epic that is sort of being projected onto the the, the canvas of colonialism because that is such like a rich sort of tapestry. And onto that, Rachel, comes the show, comes Pachinko, and again told across multiple generations of families. It also has some serious heavyweights when it comes to well-regarded Korean actors. You've got Oscar winner Yoon Yeo-jung, and you also have Lee mm-hmm. Min-ho, who is an OG K-drama actor. Right, so of all the actors that we see in the show, do you, do you want, maybe you want to talk about some of the characters here. What's the character that you follow the most closely, that you've fallen in love the most with? 
So Anna wise, Naomi is a really easy answer for that because she's stunning. She's amazing. I love seeing her career kind of blossom into what it is mm. uh, with Shogun, you know, before uh, it, recently and Emmy nominations and everything like that. Yeah. For me, though, the character that I really was probably the most compelled with, the one that I was following the closest with uh, Han, I'm going to butcher this thing, I'm so sorry, but Han Kum Jai, mm. uh, which was the Korean grandmother who Solomon was trying to convince to sell her property to uh, Shifley's. I just thought the actress, her name's Park Hee Jin, she just created, she com- she portrayed this idea of like the weight of all of the discrimination, all of the trauma, all of the mm. challenges that she'd gone through um, in her lifetime, but then also the generations before her, the generations that are going to come after her. And I thought she did it so well. And that storyline in particular, I just found really, really touching. And the one mm-hmm. that I kept being like, let's go back to her. Let's go back to her. Uh, but I mean, all around some really, really tremendous performances um, mm-hmm. throughout the entire show and every character. It's really interesting because every character, every timeline, you kind of want to visit. You don't want to be like, I-, I don't really care about this one. Yeah. Like you're, you're into all of them. And I think that's pretty unique for a show um, that is as multiverse, if you will, as yeah. this one. Yeah, you quite often hear that, like when 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 shows are certain span generations, people have attached to certain time periods yeah. and not others. You never really hear that about Pachinko. No one's like, I don't want to spend any time in this particular time period. Michelle, what about you? Who's the most compelling character that you find yourself, you know, keeping returning to? So I think this is kind of a generic response, but it is That's truly okay. heartfelt on my part. Yeah. Um, I just love. Sanja, who is kind of, she's the protagonist. She's the character um, that you see played actually by three different actresses because mm. um, she takes us through. She's the point of continuity between the show's opening in 1915, like not long after Japan has, you know, annexed Korea, the Korean Peninsula, uh, up through 1989, mm. um, which is incidentally, you know, the end of the Cold War and a kind of, you know, we're, these, this is multiverse, um, as Rachel just said, because it's almost unimaginable to think about one person, one lifetime, um, spanning all of these different places and just ways that the world exists. Mm. Um, but that is one of the key aspects of the show. It's why I think it's so novel, because if you're doing a historical epic, you usually kind of stay confined in this kind of elsewhere you know land in the past but this show really kind of moves us around um these timelines and it kind of forces us to integrate our understanding of the world past and present rachel i've not yet started pachinko but the the i know i hear you i I made the same face that's totally a reasonable face to to give me but when i was talking about the show with one of our producers jane vancouverton she was like i will never look at rice ever the same again (laughs) and 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 she said this somewhat tearfully so let's talk about the way that food plays a role in the show particularly rice do you want to talk about that and the themes that it sort of connects to So rice is life, right? Like rice is life, rice in Asian countries, but not just Asian countries, African countries, Mm -hmm. Latin countries, like it is a staple. You do not have a meal without rice. There is always, doesn't matter what you're eating, there will be some white rice being cooked. And I think there is uh, sometimes, I think that maybe the mistake that people make of just saying, well, rice is rice. Rice is not just rice. Rice is very different depending on which Mm. country you go to, how it's cooked, how it's Mm. made. And specifically within Asian countries, like there is Korean wild rice, there's Japanese sticky rice, there's the Chinese kind of rice, the basmati rice in India, you know, like we have so many different sorts. And anybody who has moved away from home and lived somewhere else for a little while, the second that you taste something from home, it Mm. takes you back. It gives you that kind of warm, cuddly feel. It makes you really comforted. In the context of pachinko, though, everything that is going on to be able to taste the rice of your home country, of your homeland, it represents not just the comforts of home, but it's also everything that was kind of taken away from you, everything that you're being persecuted against. And in the bowl of rice, you find a connection with other people where you know, in with the Koreans in Pachinko, they're all being discriminated against by the Japanese uh, mm. simply for being Korean. And so when they're able to meet other Koreans and kind of share that bowl and have that comfort of home, it's like an acceptance, like you're safe here. This is your safe space and all through a bowl of rice, because like I said, rice is life. And it's 
it's an it's a really interesting touching point that they put in the show of something kind of seemingly simple seemingly banal but like it really does resonate throughout and i think everybody when you see that scene when you see that scene of, of sunja eating the rice as an older woman and recognizing instantly and there's like an unspoken thing of mm. ah like i know what this rice is it's really it's super emotional and i hope one day i mean you will get to that episode and you will watch this because i feel like you will be moved just as anybody else would because it's it's truly you know quite a remarkable feat of storytelling i yeah. think from the show's creators to 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 put so much meaning in something so simple and something so everyday rachel i don't stand a chance of making it through that episode because i was getting teary hearing you describe <laughs> that let alone experiencing the thing but also i i have to say like michelle one of the things that people talk about with the show is the emotional journey of watching the show is the, the idea that this show carries a lot of emotional weight do you want to just describe what it feels like to watch an episode of pachinko yes um well so i will put this in very kind of specific terms of myself as a member of the korean diaspora yeah. it has a particular emotional weight for me because Everything that I'm seeing kind of depicted in the show um, historically is a history that has also affected my family, has mm. kind of made it it possible for me to be here. And mm -hmm. so there's that, you know, like the the show does a really good job of, of weaving together the historical and then again, you know, the kind of characterological, personal, sort of emotional. Mm -hmm. And um, it does this in so many different ways and it integrates, you know, like archival footage of, you know, news and, and kind of a historical vision of, of what's going on. It's really telling you this is like a big collective story, but also very personal one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's also lots of points of connection with, you know, any immigrant story, any immigrant story is one about the factors that have led people to leave home. And it's mm. going to have to do with personal desires, ambitions, um, family dynamics within, you know, a nuclear family or extended family, but it's also going to have to do with large social and political changes that are occurring. Right. So yeah. Um, one thing I'll say is that, you know, as a, a avid watcher of Asian melodramas, Asian, mm -hmm. Asian TV series, I feel like this show is so, um, it's really well balanced because it hits some of those notes and mm. it brings in a kind of familiarity. If you watch, you know, K dramas or C dramas, or, you know, you watch, um, this kind of, uh, yeah, storytelling, um, it'll be familiar to you, but it's not so much in the melodrama territory. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's going to alienate folks who maybe are not used to that kind of emotional mm -hmm. tenor in the entertainment that they choose to partake in. I was going to say, Rachel, that there's something to the idea that, you know, as you're watching the show, a show that is dealing with a lot of real life human tragedy, there is this risk of sort of uh, veering towards the melodramatic because you are dealing with these like large sort of grand sweeping um, emotions. How do you feel about the way that uh, Pachinko handles like the sheer emotional weight on, on the story that it's trying to tell? I think they've done, like like Michelle said, they've kind of found that perfect balance. They've found that ability to tell a story, a historical story that is filled with a lot of emotion. Mm. A lot of people will watch it and, you know, it's it's kind of hard to almost describe how emotional these these bits are um, yeah. for in terms of the history of it all. But when I heard that they were doing the show, I was like, I don't even know if I want to watch it because I thought it might just be a little bit too heavy. I, I didn't yeah. know if I was really prepared for it. I heard Koganada and Justin Chan were going to be directing um, all the episodes in the first season. So I, that gave me a lot of reassurance because those two, in my opinion, are two of probably the best storytellers that we have right now and mm. probably don't get the credit that they deserve. So I'm glad that they have this opportunity to get that. So I'm not surprised that they've been able to kind of balance that weight and balance that. And, you know, the thing is, though, with this section of history, especially between those two countries, you don't have to do a lot to make it dramatic. Like mm. it was a horrific time in it's a really dark period of, of the world's history, um, but especially in Asia. And it's it's one that, you know, you could literally just play it out from the textbook and it would be this emotional. You don't have to add Hollywood notes onto it or, 
you know, Asian notes, Asian dramatic notes, which can be very dramatic. Let's sure. be fair now. Yeah. You don't have to do that because it is what it is. Uh, I think that is a perfect place to leave it. I promise, Rachel and Michelle, the minute that I leave <laughs> today, I'm going to go watch the first episode. In the meantime, <laughs> I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much for watching this. And thank you so much for being here to talk about it. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having us, Elmin. Thanks. Michelle Cho is an assistant professor of Korean film and media studies at the University of Toronto. And Rachel Ho is a film critic at Exclaim Magazine. Season two of Pachinko is available right now on Apple TV+. <laughs> I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, we're going to switch gears now. And I, I hope you have the stomach for this. Yesterday, we had the ultimate showdown between two other greats, Joey Chestnut versus Takaru Kobayashi. They are giants and legendary rivals in the world of competitive eating. Kobayashi actually came out of retirement to face off against the world record holder in a competition that was streamed live on Netflix yesterday. Chestnut! Kobayashi, both with personal records, but the 16-time champion is going to walk away and win her. There's 10 seconds to go as the fans count it down. Three, two, one. She called us. Joey Chestnut didn't just win. Joey Chestnut set a brand new world record, which was 83 hot dogs in 10 minutes. 83 hot dogs and 83 buns, to be specific. Don't forget the buns. Matt Hart was watching yesterday. He's been watching contests like this since he was a teenager, and he's back with us now. Matt Hart, welcome back to the show, friend. How's it going, man? Listen, I'm happy that you're here. Talk to me about the emotions that you felt as you were watching this yesterday. Uh, well, I would have to say that I felt mostly sad and gross watching it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, in the sense that this was kind of like hot dog quality entertainment like mm. they kind of threw everything into it there was a bunch of these like little mini contests where it was like chicken wings and then there was watermelon and all of this stuff was there sure to to distract us from the inevitable that happens at all uh competitive food eating contests which is this caligula like spectacle of wet meat being ingested by two men. And that's a hard sell. Do you want to talk about the history between Kobayashi and Chestnut? Because like these are two of the greats at competitive eating, but also that has to be qualified a little bit. We got to just talk about their dynamic. What is their dynamic, the two of them? Yeah, I mean, not to take away from these guys and what they accomplished. Like, I mean, this is very physically impressive to do this. I mean, the last time they met was 15 years ago. So uh, they yeah. already had a history before that. Uh, Joey was champion. But um, I think a lot of this stems from when this sport kind of kicked off sport. Yeah. Kind of kicked Thank off. Thank you for the quotation um, marks. Yeah. Yes. In, in, in the kind of iteration that we know it now. Um it was it was kicked off at Nathan's where they held it yesterday, and um, you know America was like USA, let's eat the most hot dogs, and Japan came in and was like no 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 no, and crushed. And so uh, when when uh, Kobayashi came in, actually it was the top three that year were Japanese competitors, yeah, and Kobayashi came in and just crushed it. So I think um, Joey Chestnut was like this answer to this wave of. Uh, Japanese um, competitive eaters, and he was supposed to be, you know, the American savior for it. And 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 he became that. Like that's like there's no there's no underselling that he became that. Like the, for the past, I don't know how many years, fifteen years, sixteen years or so, Joey Chestnut has kind of been like synonymous with Fourth of July for a lot of people. Like that's mm -hmm. the day that you watch Joey Chestnut beat everybody, and they're not even close. But you want to talk a little bit more about like the why are Kobayashi and Chestnut such bitter rivals? Like what's the rivalry there? Well, I mean, in any again sport, yeah. uh, you, you when you've got the two elite players, the you know the Jordan and Bird, there's always going to be. Uh, I, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's not but it's, just it, Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. Okay, continue. I, I, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> they. Uh, 
Yeah. They're 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 undeniably um amazing competitors yeah. and the way they they can contort their bodies is uh, unbelievable, and there's a lot of money on the line at some of these contests. Yeah, hundred so, grand, um, right? You can win uh, substantial amount of money for, yes, yeah. And I mean, God knows what else they got on top of it. Mustard sponsorships, who knows? Sure. Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's always going to be competition in that sense. There's been cheating allegations. You know, Joey Chestnut always calls him out for being a crybaby and saying he's got injuries. There was a, a jaw injury that he had sustained. Uh, so, you know, regular kind of trash talk, sport trash talk. Well, can we just say Kobayashi came out of retirement for this. Uh, is it true mm-hmm. that he doesn't even like competitive eating? Like, what's going on there? So, yeah, it sounds like he retired because it had wreaked havoc on his body, obviously. Like, yeah. n- no one should eat that many glizzies in one sitting. Um, but he, um, he no, eventually... Yeah. No, he he eventually got to a point where he said he couldn't I- experience hunger like traditional people do mm. and really regrets his relationship with food now. So I hope he saved his money. <laughs> I hope so, too. Because hey, it I, sounds like he doesn't want to do this going forward. Can I ask you, like, here's a technical question, because, like, mm. I'm a big dude. And honestly, I can eat one hot dog and I'm like, that's. That's it. We're we're good. I sure don't want to experience more of this feeling. Uh, Joey Chestnut put down eighty three yesterday. Not a big guy. Kobayashi, mm-hmm. not a big guy either. Like, what is going on there? How do they do it? Well, I'm with you. I'm. I look kind of like a bag of a, a bag of milk covered in cinnamon without my shirt <laughs> off. So uh, I know what it's like to be a larger gentleman. But uh, it's not. Here's the thing. You worry about the skinny guys. <laughs> You sure. always worry about the skinny guys. When As in like they're eating. the threat is what you're saying. Absolutely. Like mm. when it comes to eating, that's my lived experience is that the skinny guys can really put it back. And it's, it's, here's the interesting thing about this pseudo sport is yeah. that um, it's like, uh, it's, it's the first kind of self-taught sport. So there's not a lot of technique. We're, we're only going back in a, in this sense, you know, 30, 40 years kind of thing. So mm-hmm. a lot of these guys, it's trial and error and learning from their previous, uh, previous competitors. And yeah. so you see stuff like the water, which they, they dunk, sometimes there. they dunk the, 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 the hot dogs in the water. They weren't yes. allowed, they weren't allowed to do that at this competition, right? They weren't allowed to pour the water on the hot dogs at all. That was, I think, strategically just to, for grossness sake, because <laughs> we knew it was going to get gross, but you, when you add the water in there, it becomes some kind of mouth stew, and it's they even weighed what they didn't swallow at the end. I was like, I'm sorry, this is always going to be a circus sideshow. I, I did. Thank you so much for using the grossest possible way to describe that. I, I mean, like that's oh, you're, you're it, it means a lot to me. Look, aside from crying a winner, which we did, Joey Chestnut, Joey Chestnut, um, I, I sort of talked about this very romantically um, after the win yesterday. He was like, Kobayashi, he's the one who really pushes me. And sh- sure enough, he pushed him to a new record. Uh, Joey Chestnut said he's always been chasing more than 80 hot dogs, and he did it. He got to 83 yesterday, which is an unbelievable sentence to say out loud. But I just want to bring us back to the world of entertainment here because there's a lot more writing on this for net- Netflix. What is at stake for the streamer that is doing more and more uh, live events like this i think this is a trial run or one of many trial runs that they're doing for uh the tyson fight hmm. uh this is this is dabbling mike in the, tyson jake g- paul yeah. yeah yeah mike tyson jake paul that's going to be a huge draw for them uh and i think they're doing a lot of um ramping up to some of these really big live sporting events and you saw stuff like I even I've been on here to talk about that comedy show Kill Tony. There's talks that they yeah. might be doing some kind of live thing with them. Oh wow! Um, so yeah, Netflix is really looking to get into to live stuff here, and I think that's a really low stakes way of doing it. Like if a hot dog contest goes wrong, who cares? Yeah. If the Tyson <laughs> Paul fight goes wrong, yeah. it's probably billions riding on it. Yeah, we've we've also talked about a little bit about this um, on the show about how they have the contract to broadcast um, WWE's Raw Monday Night Raw live for the next like five years or so, um, starting in the next year. So you spend all that time, you know, teaching people that you could stream content whenever you want, and then suddenly you're like, actually, appointment viewing is back. We're yeah. doing li- <laughs> they reinvented television. It's incredible. Matt Hart, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate you being here. Oh, always happy to help, man. Uh, I'll see you next time we're talking about glizzies. Oh, man, I don't feel good saying that word at all. So I'm a glizzy gladiator. (laughs) Thank you for your time, dude. I appreciate it. Matt Hart is a regular here on Commotion. He's also a member of the band The Russian Futurists. If you miss the competition, you can watch Unfinished Beef on Netflix right now.
That is it for the podcast today. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Instagram. We are at Commotion CBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This show is called Commotion. We'll be back tomorrow. I'll see you then. Thank you.